All right, so welcome back. This is going to be actually our second screencast for section 10.2. And what we're going to do in this screencast is we are going to focus more closely at the process of cell division in eukaryotic cells. Now, just to recall, we had talked about the cell cycle last time, and we had looked at the cell cycle in regards to both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. But like I said, we're going to focus primarily on eukaryotic cells for this um, video. Now remember that the eukaryotic cell cycle is going to consist of four distinct phases. We have G1, we have S, we have G2, then of course the M phase. Now the M phase is going to be the phase that we're actually going to focus the most on in this screencast. Now over here on the right hand side you can see that the G1 phase, which is right over here on the right, is going to be the phase of the cell cycle where most of the growth of the cell is going to occur. So in addition to growth, of course, we're going to be producing more proteins and we're going to be producing more organelles. Now, if this particular cell has decided to go into cell division, in other words, divide, then it's going to go ahead and enter into the S phase. And remember, S is going to stand for synthesis. And synthesis is going to involve DNA replication. So that DNA has to be replicated before the cell can actually divide into two new daughter cells. Now the third part of the cell cycle is going to be that G2 phase. And of course if the DNA is replicated it means the cell is preparing to divide. And so we need to make sure that we synthesize or make any organelles that are necessary to make sure that cell division occurs correctly. And so all of that is going to happen in the G2 or the GAP2 phase. And of course all three of these put together will actually incorporate the interphase portion of the cell cycle. And so G1, S, and G2 make up the interphase. Um, but again, like I had said, we're going to talk primarily in this particular screencast on cell division. And we're going to look at the two parts of that M phase or that cell division part of the cell cycle. We're going to look at cytokinesis, which is going to be the division of the cytoplasm. And remember mitosis, which is one part of this cell division cycle that um, actually involves the division of the nucleus. Now the very first um, phase that you would find in the M phase or mitosis part of cell division is going to be a phase called prophase. Now during prophase, this is going to be the very first time that you can actually see chromosomes in the microscope. Now prophase, if you notice over here on the right, involves a basic um, breakdown of that cell membrane. And as we had said, those that DNA material has become very, very condensed. In other words, they've actually been drawn together into some very compact structures, and those structures are chromosomes. And during prophase, you can actually now see those chromosomes. Now, they have been duplicated, remember, because that duplication occurred during the S part of the cell cycle. Now, remember, S stands for synthesis or to make. So, in other words, those chromosomes have been duplicated in preparation for division because they need to be distributed evenly to the daughter cells. Now, in addition to um, being able to see the duplicated chromosomes, we can now see a special cell part called a centriole. And you can see the centrioles right here. Now, remember during the um, GAP2 phase, we had said that if the cell is getting ready to divide, it needs to synthesize or to make some very special organelles that are important to make sure division occurs correctly, and centrioles would be one of those. Another structure that would be produced during that GAP2 part of the cell cycle would be the spindle fibers. And the spindle fibers are going to be connected to the centrioles and eventually connected to the um, chromosomes as well. So the spindle is going to form and it's going to actually connect at a special point on the chromosome called a centromere. And you can see the centromeres right here on these chromosomes on the right hand side. So eventually, as I had said, those spindles which are now connected to the centrioles are actually going to connect to those um, centromeres on the chromosomes. Now one thing I didn't mention is that of course these um, centrioles, once they're formed, they will move to opposite sides. In other words, there was actually two pairs of centrioles here to begin with, but this picture shows those centrioles moving to the opposite sides or the poles of the cell. So in addition to that nuclear envelope breaking down, we also need to understand that the nucleolus, that was the site of protein synthesis in the cell, and that very dense dark region in the nucleus is also going to break down as well. 
Now the second phase of mitosis is called metaphase. And in fact, this is one of the easiest phases to recognize when looking at a cell that's acti actively dividing. Now during metaphase, what you're going to find is the centrioles have already made their way to the opposite ends of the cell. As we had said, the spindle fibers, which are these green lines that you see right here, are connected to the centrioles. But now they're also connected to the centromeres of each of the chromosomes, the duplicated chromosomes found within the cell. And what kind of makes this some particular phase unique is that uh, if you notice the chromosomes have lined up in the very middle of the cell. Now this is important because in order to make sure that one copy of that duplicated chromosome goes to each daughter cell, it's a lot easier to do that if you organize your chromosomes in a pretty succinct or organized way. And in this case, they've done that by lining up in the middle of the cell. Now this particular phase is also considered one of the shortest phases in the uh, mitotic phase of the cell cycle. Now the third phase of mitosis is called anaphase, and in anaphase the centromeres which originally had connected the identical chromosomes to each other have now been separated. And if you notice the spindle fibers that are connected to the centromere and to the centrioles on opposite sides of the cell are working to pull those identical chromosomes apart. And so now instead of being considered a pair of duplicated chromosomes, we now have individual chromosomes being pulled to the opposite poles of the cell. So the fourth and final phase of mitosis is called telophase. Now this phase is really important because this is going to be the phase where you actually get the reforming of the nuclear envelopes or the nuclear membranes for each group of chromosomes on the opposite poles of the cell. So that nuclear envelope is going to reform around each of the clusters and these chromosomes are going to start to decondense, which means they're actually going to start to basically pull apart and become the chromatin that they were before cell division actually occurred. So in addition to this, you're also going to notice that during telophase, the spindle is going to start to break down. So these fibers that were connected to the centromere and to the centrioles are going to start to break down. And the nucleolus is going to become visible again in the nuclei that you find on both sides of the cell. Now the second part of the M phase of the cell cycle is called cytokinesis. And cytokinesis basically means a separating of the cytoplasm and the um, cell membrane if it's an animal cell or the cell wall and cell membrane if we're talking about plant cells. So if you notice in animals it says the cell membrane is going to be drawn in until the cytoplasm is going to be pinched into two equal parts. And so when we talked about prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, we were essentially talking about dividing that nucleus into two brand new nuclei. So in this case with cytokinesis, we're talking about dividing the cell membrane and of course dividing that cytoplasm. And if you notice over here on the right, this is going to be an example of an animal cell. And so what we have is we have a special sort of pinching in that's going to occur with that cell. And sometimes they refer to that pinched in part of the cell as a cleavage furrow. Now if you notice as this cleavage furrow continues to pinch in, eventually after a period of time it's going to separate that cell into two brand new daughter cells. And each daughter cell, of course, has its own individual nucleus and, of course, its own individual organelles. Now, as I had said, if it is a plant cell, you will have a division of the cell membrane, but because we have that cell wall, that cell is not flexible enough to be pinched in and form this cleavage furrow. So instead, we have a formation of a special structure called a cell plate. And you can see the cell plate beginning to form right down here. Now, what's going to happen is, as this cell continues to divide, this cell plate, which starts off in the middle of the cell, is going to continue to make its way to the opposite ends. In other words, it's going to merge with the cell wall that you find on the opposite ends of the cell. And once that merge has taken place, then we have two complete brand new daughter cells. And again, each new daughter cell has its own nuclei, and of course, um, each has its own set of organelles. So instead of being called a cell plate, once it has met up with the cell wall on each side, it is now considered a new cell wall. So when you talk about the cell cycle itself, or you even just talking about cell division, you need to understand that there are very special chemicals or proteins that are there to regulate 
the timing of that cycle. In other words, how much time is spent in G1, in S, in G2, and of course how much time is spent in the four different phases and cytokinesis that are found within the M part of the cell cycle. Now we give a special name to these regulatory proteins and we call them cyclins. Now there's actually two different types of cyclins or two different types of regulators. We call them internal regulators or internal cyclins and we have those called external regulators or external cyclins. Now if it's an internal regulator these are going to be proteins that actually respond to anything that's occurring inside of the cell. So what they do is they allow the cell cycle to proceed only once certain processes have happened inside of that cell. Now a good example of this would be on the right. This is an example of the metaphase part of mitosis. So the only way that metaphase can actually proceed into anaphase or telophase is if these chromosomes line up in the center of the cell. Because remember they have to line up to make sure that each brand new daughter cell gets a copy of that replicated chromosome. So if they didn't line up in the middle there would be a chance that maybe there would be an unequal distribution of this chromosomal material. So there are special chemicals, special proteins that make sure anaphase and telophase don't occur until this part of mitosis has actually happened. So these would be considered internal regulators. Now again as we had said there are external regulators and actually growth factors down here towards the bottom would be an example of an external regulator but these are proteins that respond to events now outside of the cell. So they direct cells to either speed up or to slow down that cell cycle. Now if you notice it says for growth factors that they are very important when it comes down to embryonic development, in other words development of that embryo but they're also really important when it comes down to wound healing and that's one of the examples you see over here on the right. So say for example if you notice we have an x-ray here and of course there's been a fracture that's occurred, in other words a, a break in this bone. Well because the break has occurred and this would be considered something happening outside of the cell there would be special um, proteins or chemicals, again regulators, that are going to encourage the cells along this fracture point start to divide and to divide rapidly because we want to make sure that that broken bone gets healed as quickly as possible. So that would be considered an external regulator. Now of course sometimes cell division doesn't go quite as we planned. Now if you have a relative, if you have a friend, if you know somebody who has cancer, this is a good example of cell division gone awry. Um, cancer itself is a disorder in which there are defects in those genes um, that are found within the cell or maybe defects in those proteins that actually determine um, how that cell is going to go through the cell cycle. And so what cancer basically is, is basically when a cell is losing that ability to control cell growth. And there's lots of different things out there that can actually cause this. Um, smoking would be one of those. Um, exposure to radiation, maybe in the form of x-rays, CAT scans for example. Um, maybe you inherited a defective gene and that gene is responsible for producing that protein that actually regulates that cell cycle. And there's also some viruses out there that can actually um, cause cancer as well. In other words, they interfere again with those regulatory proteins, with those cyclins. Now if you have cancer typically you will have something called a tumor and you can see the tumor over here on the right in this picture. A tumor is basically an uncontrollable mass of cells that are growing out of control. If you notice we have the normal cells on each side but for whatever reason there might have been one cell that did not respond to those um, regulatory proteins, those cyclins as it should and what happened is that cell began to divide out of control. So it doesn't really know when to stop dividing. Now there's two different types of tumors. We have one called a benign tumor and we have one called a malignant tumor. Um, if you have a benign tumor, they consider this type of tumor non-cancerous. And it's non-cancerous because it doesn't tend to spread to the surrounding healthy tissue. And if that's the case, they tend to actually be very treatable and easily removed. Now if you have a malignant tumor, this is the type of tumor that is considered cancerous because it invades and it destroys surrounding healthy tissue. And in addition to that, it's also going to do something called metastasize. 
and if it metastasizes, it means it can actually spread or leave the original tumor and make it to other parts of the body. So this would be considered a malignant tumor. And this is the one that we hear the most about in the media, etc., because it's definitely the most dangerous of the two types of tumors. All right, so that's going to finish up our second and final screencast for section 10.2. Please remember to make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.